is FSN. Yeah, thank you, Simon. It's the BBG, not the BBC. You're listening to the Richie Allen Radio Show, live from Salford in Greater Manchester. It's the Richie Allen Show, broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Yes, a grey day in Salford, but a pair of wellies arrived in the post today. A big pair of green wellies. So I don't mind anymore taking the dogs out. How are you? Fiona Marie Flanagan, Irish academic, social commentator and pro-life activist, returns to the programme this hour. Looking forward to catching up with Fiona. And in hour two, the author and former Democratic politician, Dean Henderson, great friend of mine, been with me for many years. He joins me live from Missouri, so a pretty packed programme. It is Thursday. It is uh, the 8th of October 2020, and it is your Richie Allen radio show. How you doing? You well? Eh? Good. Don't be complaining to me. <laughs> I'd complain, but but who'd listen? I came down, listen, wait till I tell you. <laughs> wait till I tell you. <laughs> I came downstairs from the studio. I broadcast from a beautiful purpose-built studio in my home. And I spend quite a bit of time in it during the day. And I came downstairs from the studio yesterday and I thought I was in an aviary. And this is true. I live with a beautiful, very eccentric, very spiritual French, very French woman. Come down yesterday and into the living room, thought I was in an aviary because all I could hear was this. Right? And I couldn't figure out where the sound was coming from until I realised that it was coming from the stereo. Right? So I said to the missus, what's that, says I? Well, she says, it's a CD that I got online. A CD of birds singing. So I says to her, What kind of fuckery are you? Give it to me, I says. Give me a look at it. So I've got it here in my hand. Hang on. <clears throat> this is it. Right, you hear it? Opening and closing. This is genuine now. I have it in my hand. It's British Library presents British bird sounds on CD. The definitive audio guide to birds in Britain. Definitive now. Because there's a thousand CDs of birds tweeting in record shops. And we need to know the definitive one so we don't get ripped off. And on the back, we turn over to the back, it says, and I quote, This two CD set is the ideal guide for anyone wishing to learn the sounds of the great variety of birds that can be seen and heard throughout the season in Britain. It's brilliant now. Do you want to have a listen to it? Let's have a listen. This is the actual CD, and this is track one. Here we go. Black-throated diver. (laughs) Lovely. And another one, track two. Red-throated diver. Red-throated diver. (laughs) Track three. Little Grebe. That's the little grebe. That's the little grebe, right. Well, I suppose it's useful. It'll settle many an argument in the countryside. People will be out walking around in the nation's great natural parks. What was that? That was a red-throated diver, I think. No, it wasn't. It was a black-throated one. Get the CD. Get the feckin' CD out of the car. That's the eccentricity of my missus. I think she wanted to buy a CD with nothing but bird sounds or bird songs not one with descriptions of the birds themselves where did you buy it says I Amazon says she the British library must have asked Amazon to stock their bird song CD Amazon said no ah go on says the British library go on so five years ago Amazon took one one copy of the CD and it's been gathering dust ever since in an Amazon warehouse in Milton Keynes in fact I have it on good authority that they ran a sweepstake. It's been going for years on the gender, the age and the ethnicity of the Muppet who would order it. So when my missus clicked buy British bird sounds the other day on Amazon, 
right? <laughs> the alarm went off and the question went out, who had crazy French cat lady in the sweepstakes? You did, Jill? Well done, well done. Vitamin D, vitamin D3, the big pharmaceutical companies are terrified of it. Running scared. If everyone got enough vitamin D3, it had closed down most of those companies, AstraZeneca, GSK and the rest, the death corporations. Adam Bolton was on Sky News this morning with Rupa Hook. Rupa Hook or Rupa Hook is a Labour MP. Here's Adam Bolton. Uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for being with us. I'm a little bit puzzled by this because uh, covering the COVID outbreak, I had experts talking to me about uh, the possibility of uh, uh, vitamin D uh, being a key factor uh, in this outbreak. I went to see my GP the other day about another matter and he, in conversation, mentioned vitamin D. Why, why haven't we heard more about it? Why haven't we heard more about it? My GP says to me, vitamin D... Why haven't we heard more about it? Let's ask Rupa. Rupa, why? Yeah, I mean, look, the more you look into it, there are studies as long as your arm from eminent uh, scientists. And I've mentioned this a couple of times in the chamber. Every time I do, I'm deluged with medics emailing in saying that the health secretary's wrong. He said that there was no association between uh, COVID-19 and vitamin D. <laughs> Matt Hancock is your health secretary who says vitamin D is no good for COVID or for viruses. Matthew! You stupid, ignorant son of a bitch, dumb bastard! Jesus Christ, I've met some dumb bastards in my time, but you outdo them all! Yes, Matt has to take out his Hancock to count to 11, and he still can't manage it. So Rupa went along to see Matt Hancock yesterday with a Tory grandee. So David Davis and I went to see him yesterday and in one of those sit-down meetings you can rationalise a bit more than across the chamber where it's these snippy exchanges and you never get a right of reply. And I'm quite positive that he's looking into this now and just as long as we're not uh, too late because vitamin D is a weird one. It's not like a normal nutrient. It's not in food very much. We know vitamin C is in your citrus fruits and stuff. Vitamin D is only pretty much in oily fish and you have to eat a lot of it. It would be 10 portions of salmon a day, I think, to get your required amount. And it's in egg yolks, but it comes in uh, UV rays as they hit the skin. So, I mean, look, it's pretty murky outside now. We were meeting with uh, Hancock when it was six o'clock, it was pitch black. I hope that we're not too late. Um, why, why has it not been recommended up to now? Maybe- Why has it not been recommended up to now? Ma on kesht, a Colleen. Maybe it's because it's sort of always been under our nose, unlike some of these other moonshot things that we're promised, dextromethadone, some of these other new drugs. It's always been known for its properties on bones, uh, so osteoporosis, that kind of thing. But, I mean, any vitamin really is good for immunity. Yeah. And up to now, uh, the health department has been saying that it's not proven enough but the thing is, I mean, what have we got to lose? Really, we've got the worst death toll in Europe. It's not bad for you. So just putting it in government messaging to take your supplements, which I think you are now, are you, Adam? Uh, Do you feel well, a younger well, I'm man? I'm talking to you about it. I mean, I'm not a doctor. You're not a doctor. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. Adam, you said this at the very beginning of the interview, you dipstick. I went to see my GP the other day about another matter, and he, in conversation, mentioned vitamin D. Why, why haven't we heard more about it? Muppet. Muppet Bolton. Yes, why haven't we heard more about it indeed? Because it's very good for you. <laughs> you never hear public health officials talking about things that are very good for you. Particularly vitamin D supplements. Which, as she went on to point out later on in the interview, later on in the interview, very cheap. So vitamin D and vitamin D3 are cheap and cheerful. So why don't we hear more about it, says Adam Bolton. Yeah, it is 13 minutes past the hour. Approaching it. Yes, yes. Imagine buying a CD thinking that it'll be ambiance, just bird songs and lovely trickling water and all that. And you end up buying one with a guy trying to teach you how to recognise these bird songs. Marvellous. It's all good fun. This is your Richie Allen radio show. Let's talk about something a bit more serious than that. Have you been reading about the Edinburgh University study today, have you? Well, why haven't you, Dom Kopf? Why haven't you, you struns? Eh? 
Yegala. I'm going to get all the colloquialisms. I'm going to get all the every country in the world. You, fr- you flaming drongo. Have you not read about the study, the Edinburgh University study? It's an amazing thing. Released last night. The Daily Mail, the Daily Telegraph picked up on it. The results of the Edinburgh University study into the handling of the alleged pandemic makes devastating reading for the dipsticks, the dickheads who believe in the lockdown as a legitimate measure in dealing with such things as respiratory infections, let alone pandemics. Okay, what did the study find? An exhaustive study, by the way, peer-reviewed. What did it find? Well, the rules, the lockdown will cause far more deaths long term. No shit, Sherlock. Eight out of ten people who are testing positive for COVID have no symptoms whatsoever. We knew that anyway. Lockdown present, prevents, prevents even, the build-up of herd immunity. It's terrible. Lockdown has made things worse in 19 out of 20 of the northern towns that had subsequent local lockdowns. Again, no shit, Sherlock. Lovely, eh? This should bring the government down, shouldn't it? But it won't. One of those involved, Professor Graham Ackland, he's a computer simulation expert, Edinburgh University. He was on Sky News. Please listen very carefully to Professor Ackland. A thing that wasn't widely reported at the time, but is actually in the paper, if you look carefully enough, is that any set of interventions that you put in place lead to um, hundreds of thousands of deaths. What was that again? What did you just say? A thing that wasn't widely reported at the time, but is actually in the paper, if you look carefully enough, is that any set of interventions that you put in place lead to um, hundreds of thousands of deaths. Any intervention you put in place will lead to hundreds of thousands of deaths. What we should have done was sod all. Sweet Fanny Adams, niente, nothing. Except for, of course, making sure that we gave a lot of vitamin D3 to those vulnerable to infections. Yeah, yeah. He went on. Um, And particularly curious was this uh, fact that uh, the intervention of adding schools, while it suppressed the first wave quite significantly, um, led to more deaths later on in the the second wave and, and perhaps in subsequent waves if the second wave is also flattened. So, so you're looking at this, I suppose, with the benefit of hindsight, with the, with the data that we now have. And, and, I, and I think most would admit now that school closures is something that is wanted to be avoided at all costs during uh, this second wave. Given how little we knew then and the rate at which cases were doubling in March, did the government have any option or did it miss something? Mm. Hindsight, she says backing the government. You have the benefit of hindsight, she says. Now, you listen very, very, very carefully to his response. You're wrong, actually. We specifically used only the data that was available in March. Did right. Listen again. We specifically used only the data that was available in March. You're wrong, actually. We specifically used only the data that was available in March to do this study. We wanted to know what they actually knew um, of course, if you put in the data that we've got now, you could do a little bit better in, in fitting what happened. They knew. But um, all of this was known and known predictable in March, and most of it was already there in the appendices in, in this report that, uh, that went to the government uh, back in March. So, yes, they, they knew that uh, closing the schools was an effective way of suppressing the number of cases, but was also... Uh, risking a longer term uh, number of deaths. You have it there, right? You have the Great Barrington Declaration. Thousands and thousands of scientists around the world now saying the lockdown was wrong. It's killing people. It'll kill more people. What's that dipstick Boris Johnson doing? That absolute fuckwit and that goon Matt Hancock? Well, they're telling us up here in the north that from next Monday, lockdown's going to get even worse. What's it going to take? I don't know. Prince William, the second in line to the throne, has been terrorising his children. He's been showing them David Attenborough's extinction documentaries and letting them listen to Greta Thunberg. (laughs) He really has. Don't let your children listen or watch Greta Thunberg. Please don't. Here is William, Prince William, speaking to Sky about conversations with the kiddies. Yeah, am I doing enough on this? Are we really at this stage in life where I can't be hugely optimistic and, and pleased that my children are getting so into nature? 
um, because you kind of worry and dread that they're soon going to realize that we're in a, a very, very um, dangerous and difficult time in the environment. And that, as a parent, you feel like you're letting them down immediately. So having watched so many David Attenborough documentaries recently with, with my children, they absolutely love them. But the most recent one, the extinction one, actually, George and I had to turn it off. We got so sad about it halfway through. <laughs> oh, God. Recently with, with my children, they absolutely love them. But the most recent one, the extinction one, actually, George and I had to turn it off. We got so sad about it halfway through. And he said to me, he said, you know, I, I don't want to watch this anymore. It's just, why is it, why has it come to this? And, you know, he's seven years old and he's asking me these questions already. He really feels it. Yeah, he feels it, does Prince George. Is that his name? Me and George got very sad watching the documentary, so we had to turn it off. Why has it come to this, said young Prince George. Prince Charlotte, Prince, Princess Charlotte, on the other hand, well, she had a stark warning for her father about the consequences for him if he doesn't do his bit to save the planet. I will rip your soul out, Daddy. I'll rip your soul out, you pathetic fuck! I think she shapeshifted there, Princess Charlotte. <laughs> oh, be Jesus. This is the Richie Allen Radio Show, the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. That's a fact, by the way. I'm Richie Allen. I'll be joined in a couple of minutes' time by Fiona Marie Flanagan, live from Balia Ohaclea. Do you agree? TV Wonder Higher Ground, the Richie Allen Radio Show, 22 minutes past five. It is Thursday's programme. The last live show of the week. If you've missed anything in the week, it's all on Spotify, iTunes, the usual places. It's on YouTube as well, though genuinely not for much longer. So that's where you'll pick up episodes you may have missed. Let's welcome back to the programme. We first spoke with her back in uh, July. I pay attention to what she's doing on social media. She's an Irish academic, social commentator and pro-life activist. Delighted to welcome back to the show Fiona Marie Flanagan. Fiona, how are you? Welcome back. Well, thank you very much for having me, Richie. I'm as well as can be expected, given the madness. Given, That's all I can say. Given the madness. And I wanted to ask you before we get into what's been happening with the virus in in uh, in my country, in our country, I wanted to ask you about something fairly disturbing. I've been covering it for many years, different countries. Apparently, a an assisted dying bill, is has it passed or is it passing the Shannon yes, in, in our country? It, my, yeah, it, it, it has passed, is my understanding. And of course, you know, everything appeals to the emotion and the em emotive issues and all the sort of extreme situations. But my heart just aches about this, Richie, I'll be honest, because to me, at least, we have a real kind of culture of death right now. And this on the back of what's happened in the care homes with the pandemic and the neglect of the elderly and, and all the mistakes that were made, I, I just think it's, it's reprehensible to be doing this at this point in time and can only prompt, you know, quick, queries about the sinister nature of what 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 about the timing the timing of this so yeah, Dreadful, yeah. very upset i i was i suppose when i thought there was a time when i thought i knew everything and i back in my late teens early 20s maybe mid 20s i would have interviewed people who are very much in favor of assisted dying and i would have given them an easy ride because i would have agreed with them at the time i would have said yeah if somebody's in really in a really bad way and there's no hope yeah, let them let them go. But of course, I've learned a lot since then. And without getting into it too deeply, my opinion today would be that there are very sinister reasons why people want to introduce assisted dying. And it's not to make life, you know, more bearable at the end. It's actually to expedite the departure of people for other reasons. And uh, yeah, I've learned quite a bit over the years. Sinister stuff that. But um, let's let's stay with 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 COVID. And I was listening to Sam McConkey from the Royal College of Irish Surgeons on BBC Two the other morning with Victoria Derbyshire. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. You had a publican on there talking about, Fiona, how devastating things are for the hospitality industry in Ireland. And here was this guy, McConkie, who doesn't have tenuous links to Bill Gates. Yeah. He's got very strong links to Gates, saying, oh, no, we should be at level five. Let's lock the country down again for a month. What's it like there now? Oh, listen, um, Richie, let, let me roll back a few days. And NEFIT, you know, they're our National Public Health Emergency yeah. Team. There was a supposed spat between the NEFIT recommendations to move to uh, level four, even with discussions about level five. Now, we have these levels 
and don't get me to try and discuss with you the difference between them because a lot of a lot of it makes no sense but obviously level five is the worst situation where we're bolted down and and moving back on to level one so there was a, a spat as it were for the public consumption because that's my personal view of it and our ex Taoiseach Leo Varadkar came out and he said no we're not going to take the Neffet recommendations because and he sort of gave a soft sock to people who would be putting the shutters down on their businesses for the last time and he almost almost made sense but what happened was a sleight of hand Richie and I believe it was a bit of smoke and mirrors because the outcome of this charade between the two the government and Neffet was that the whole country then moved into lockstep because just previously we had different situations for different counties and Dublin where I am right now was already in level three but very few other counties were so all of a sudden they manipulated the public opinion to think oh great we're not going into level four or level five we'll all stick in level three and right. every county was then you know sort of loaded into level three and then they were trying to convince us oh but you know we need extra police powers to enforce the rules because obviously you don't want people breaking the rules. So do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I believe this was just a manipulation to get us now at level three. And we are now going to move, in my view, and, and please, you know, disabuse me of that, Richie. I'd, I'd, I'd love to be proven wrong. But I believe we are heading straight for level four, level five very, very soon. Yeah, you're right, of course. I think that's great analysis. I wouldn't have considered that. I mean, I'm spending a lot of time on what's happening here. I do subscribe to the Irish Times. I think you've nailed it. Get people to, you know, to be happy, to think they've dodged a bullet by being at level three when, it, when they haven't because it's going to carry on. Are you astonished that you have the Great Barrington Declaration, you have thousands and thousands of doctors, you have the Edinburgh study, which was published last night, which says lockdowns are disastrous, we shouldn't have them. And yet, despite this, it's, it's, they just plow ahead anyway. The government here and, I should say, your government in oh. Dublin. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's beyond belief. Only I keep stopping myself and saying, look, I have a view, my own view of what their end outcome is. If I didn't, Richie, I would literally be tearing my yeah. hair out trying to understand what is the logic and the motivation behind their decisions, because they are completely anti-scientific now. I mean, they've even acknowledged. And, and what gets me is because I believe that our public have been subjected to psychological warfare over the last six to seven months a game of brainwashing it's almost mind control at this stage you know so what they have done is, is just subjected us to an enormous amount of disinformation and misinformation and even admitting as they have done now I'm not saying they've made it very very public it's almost like in the fringes we have the likes of Luke O'Neill fessing up on Pat Kenny that oh yes well the PCR test is a bit sensitive and obviously the more cycles you you use the less, you know, the less useful it is as a predictor of infectious disease, well, it shouldn't be used at all. So we have that on the one hand. And then we had the Irish Committee, which remember you you tweeted out as well, where they basically admitted that they were liberally attributing COVID deaths to everybody who had a whiff or sniff yeah. of a virus and only subject to, you know, sort of retrofitting it if a coroner gets involved and does the report. So they've told us They've actually told the public that they're fudging the cases and that they fudge the fatalities. Now, caveat, caveat, every death is sad and tragic. I am not diminishing, you know, the fact that people are dying or have died. So so please, your viewers, don't misunderstand me. But I'm trying to put thing in, things into context against, you know, the, the dreadful scenario in which we find ourselves. So, yes, Richard, to get back to your point, I mean, the science is clear. The medical professionals around the world are speaking out our Muppet puppets in government and in effort know this and yet they plough ahead aided and abetted might I say by what I have complete contempt for and make this very very open on my um, tweeting blue tick shills who are influencers and you know exactly what they're doing well I do anyway to you know in the way I see it what they're trying to do is they're trying to move public opinion so what what I believe is happening now is I know in the back of my mind we're moving towards tougher tougher restrictions but what the blue tick paid up 30 people 
pieces of silver Judas's are doing is trying to get, oh, it's only because we're not complying enough. If we were complying, it would be way better. So that's to try and steer public opinion against anyone speaking out against the lockdown. So again, the psychological manipulation is going on to try and divide the public further against each other, which is going to be catastrophic. And of course, plays into the narrative about alienating those who don't buy into this case demic at this time with no nuance at all as to the fact that the majority of us and me 99% of the people I interact with we believe in this virus passionately we know it was nasty Richie I mean I know personally of four people who've had it yeah. one quite close to me and I, I can I can tell you the suffering that went with it so I am not diminishing that virus in its most virulent form but I don't think to me anyway anyone who who has any sort of an a capability of analysis or critical thinking or as you say who's looking at the science and listening to what the professionals are saying can can go along with this it's just to me it just beggars belief. yeah you make a very good point the virus itself is not a hoax the pandemic is a hoax the yes the threat yes. to everybody's lives and calling it a disease is a hoax we've had nasty respiratory infections since forever you're absolutely right to make that point and yeah, I don't get oh, bogged I, down with that. And I have to. I have to be clear about it because, you know, the person I know who had it and I mean, it, it knocked them over for two weeks and they were a fairly strong um, individual. You know, their view of it was, yeah, yeah, it, it's nasty. It's not nice. It would be on the kind of the more extreme form of the flu. But you know, let's not stop the world. And I really agree, you know, trying to put a common sense spin on it with the Barrington report and the recommendations that are coming out this week on, yes, protect the vulnerable. But let's be sensible about this, because if we don't, we are going to lose everything. And I'm not putting I'm not being dramatic when I say this, but it is that serious. We stand on a precipice and, you know, in many respects, Richie, it may already be too late for us, you know, to roll back and try and, and be sensible about. Let me issues. be um, let me de let me be devil's advocate for a minute. What about those whom what, the, 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 the Great Barrington Declaration did make mainstream television news here yesterday and today? So the naysayers, those who disagree with it, they say, all right, fair enough, but you're asking senior citizens to live a miserable existence, basically live alone with no contact with their children in many cases and their grandchildren. That's terrible. Why subject them to that? We should all share the burden. That's the other point of view. And it's not, listen, I agree with you about the blue tick shills and we could spend all day talking about that. But there are a lot of people bewildered in society who don't know what's going on. And when they read the Great Barrington Declaration, they say, ah, I see what you want to do. Just lock up old people. Forget about them while you go and party. Yeah, look, look, I know, I know. And this is not a difficult one to try and yeah. um, work through with them. On the one hand, yes, I, I do understand. And I mean, I have I have a mother in law in the UK who was very, very frightened at the ver at the beginning of this and did take all the precautions and is only now starting to go out. But I put it to you, I mean, individually, people should be able to make the decision. And on the other hand, I do know of elderly people who say, well, you know what? I don't have that much longer to live anyway. I'm in the twilights of my years. I want to go out and live my life. I want to go and walk by the sea. I want to have that coffee with my friend. I want to go to mass. Yeah. And and there are those who won't. But but I suppose it would be different if everyone was given sort of dispassionate, logical, scientific fact in order to base their decision. What what our elderly have been subjected to, we all have, but particularly the elderly who do feel vulnerable, is this fear, and I hate to, fear pornography, let's be honest, relentless, wall-to-wall, -wall, end to end fear-mongering by our um, mainstream media. And I remember I, I wanted to send my mother-in-law the UK column, you know, because I thought this is kind of, it's, it's more middle of the road and it might get her away from the BBC, yeah. but no, it's the BBC. It's the BBC, so yeah, yeah. You're yeah, you're dealing with bless them, the age groups that source. have grown up, but <laughs> you know, it's all the BBC. So I don't think oh, this sounds awful, but I, I fear that their their ability to make a reasoned, rational decision about this has been severely compromised by the, the fear mongering and the brainwashing. And and they are literally paralyzed with fear, Richie. It's hyperbole and 
there, there, there seems to be a divide, though. In recent weeks, the print media, not just the right of centre print media, but the print media here has begun to allow people like Carl Hennigan access. They've given access to Sinetra Gupta. They've obviously gone big on the Edinburgh survey, excuse me, the Edinburgh study and on the Great Barrington Declaration. So the print media seems to have had enough of it and can see where it's going, whereas the broadcast media is still looking ahead um, in terms of basically sticking to the, the, the narrative, sticking to the plan that you described it, the fear porn, constantly mm. talking about cases, 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 knowing full well that eight out of ten of the cases, even if the PCR test is accurate, which it isn't, it's a disaster, but if that PCR test was accurate, and it isn't, but if it was, eight out of ten people testing positive don't even have any idea they've got anything in them because they're not symptomatic of anything. And uh, mainstream media won't yeah. do anything about the, the the broadcast media in our countries. I mean, Ireland is my country. I'm here in the UK. It could end this overnight, Fiona. Uh, yes, absolutely, it could. And I do echo your your sentiment there. On I had scratched my head and wondered why. I don't want to name them, but certain sort of you know uh, very popular presenters. There, one is a doctor. Yeah. Um, we're starting to veer off and starting to question things but again you know to a to a more a less charitable person than me it might be yes because they're cottoning on to things and in the end of the day when things get really bad and i fear that they will here richie everywhere actually but but in ireland if we're going to focus on that that they are they don't want the public to turn against them so it's all to me it's almost like they have to throw in a few skeptical lines or a few lines of questioning in order to actually justify themselves in yeah. the long run because as I said this is going to turn nasty um the trajectory that we're on other than that I I don't understand because my understanding is that the advertising revenue that you know Ofcom I've, I've heard in the UK has forbidden any of the mainstream broadcasters to challenge the uh the government narrative on it this is my understanding so I would therefore suggest that something similar is going on in Ireland and that they, you know, the mainstream media and the print media are literally hamstrung in what they can 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 say. You know, journalism is is a thing of the past here, unfortunately. It is. And it's, uh, well, while you're there, while you mentioned that, let me very quickly do this. You mentioned Ofcom mm. and you mentioned what the UK broadcast media can and can't do. Um, obviously, very famous presenter Eamon Holmes Here's Eamon Holmes speaking with Denise Welch, Loose Women presenter, who I've been, yeah. in to I've been in touch with, actually, if it'll play for me. There's a gremlin or two in the system. Um, but I want to play this now. Uh, I might take a minute to play it. Yeah, but Eamon Holmes in conversation with Denise Welch. I, I, you must have seen the clip on Twitter. It's I did, five or six yeah. weeks ago. He says, look, we, there are things we can't say. There are things we can't ask. And you're like, what? Yeah, I've been a journalist yeah. for well, 21, 22 years. I mean, nobody ever told me when I worked in commercial and national media, nobody ever said to me, you can't go there. But obviously, mm -hmm. with respect to COVID, well, they are being told not to go there in the interest of public health. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, I believe, I, I, I even think in the UK, there is, there are, there is more of a, a space for dissenting voices, just given the nature of your media and the nature of your alternative media over there. You know, your good self, you'd be, you'd be a primary case in this. You've interviewed all sorts of views here. But in Ireland, it's very, very different. And the, the alternative media, we're really fringe. I mean, I, I, we barely get a listen, to be honest with you. M most of our boosting gets done by international uh, viewership and, and yeah. broadcast, so it's very, very hard to scratch through or to penetrate through into the mainstream narrative here. And again, my fear because of the psychological issues and the brainwashing going on in this country, you wouldn't believe the levels of compliance, Richie, to the face masks, etc. That I feel that even if me, Hall Martin or Leah Varadkar got on national television and said, ah, lads, you know what, we were only joking. I actually still don't believe people would take off the muzzle they when they the go masks. out. They I keep don't think they would actually believe it because it's just too ingrained now. So it's almost like it doesn't matter what we say to you. We're going to press ahead and we know you're going to do it because we have you in this position. Here's a very depressing and thought now. By the way, folks, we have Fiona Marie Flanagan on the programme. The best of us, Bollyall Clear, live from Dublin. Fiona can be found on Twitter, right? Uh, it's yes. at Fiona M. 
Flanagan one at Fiona M Flanagan one follower there are thousands of followers and she discusses these things there and she appears of course on uh, excellently produced podcasts and radio shows on um, and she and takes part in them I should say on 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 YouTube as well we'll put links out to those if you are new uh, to Fiona here's a depressing thought now right for a Thursday if you've got the Great Barrington thing if you've got the Edinburgh study and all of these people are saying the lockdown is madness. If you can't get the muzzle wearers to look at that, how can you or I or anybody else get them to look at what is really going on here? That there is an agenda to transform, to turn on its head how people live their lives, this technocratic, dystopian future they want to bring in. If we can't get them to look at Carl Hennigan, who says the lockdown is killing people, how do we get them to even consider for a second what might really be going on, Fiona? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm with you there, Richie. I don't know. I go through days when I think, oh, no, this is this is it, because I'm inevitably now like, I actually genuinely have a health reason for not wearing a mask, full yeah. disclosure. But notwithstanding, when I go into supermarkets or shopping centers, I'm inevitably the only one or practically the only one. And anyone who has is unmasked as well, has come up to me and said, oh, Fiona. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, it's that Here we go. (laughs) Because, yeah, the levels of compliance around here in in Dublin, and you know what they are. They're sort of the, the, oh, they would be the, they all read the Times cover to cover and pride themselves in doing that, especially around here in South Dublin. Um, So they're very much on the kind of climate agenda and they believe everything they're told. So, yes, levels of compliance here are so high. It's only very rarely that I might. I mean, sometimes I don't bother because I get really nasty stares. No one has challenged me yet, you know, in the public has actually come up to me and had a go at me. I'm ready for them if they do, but no one has as yet. But now and again, I will attempt to talk to people. And yes, there have there has been some, you know, little chink in the armor. You know, a couple of people have said, yeah, I know this is nonsense, but what can you do? What can you, you do? Know, so, yeah, 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 what can you do? It's the thing, oh, well, we are where we are. You know, we have to get on with it. Ah, oh, well, you know, it'll be all right by Christmas. And that's the thing. They, you know, looking at it just myopically, they think, oh, well, they believe what they're told in the paper. And what the papers are doing today, I think, is insidious. I, I nearly went mad when I saw it. They were, they're basically saying, oh, if we lock down now, we can all have Christmas. Jesus now, do you see how nasty that is? Yeah, it's coming here. Playing. It's coming here. Nicholas Sturgeon in Scotland. It's coming here. They're going to announce tougher restrictions for the north of England this coming week. It's coming here, I guarantee you. You're right. They are going to go with the, let's um, make it really hard now for six weeks or whatever, and then we'll be all right at Christmas. That's a really good point you're bringing that up. That's coming yeah. next. It's yeah. coming next. I, I think I might have that Eamon Holmes clip. Unbelievable, oh. huh? Yeah, you've got a NASA type outfit here in this radio studio. It's unbelievable. And yet, <laughs> and yet, honest to God, and yet it wouldn't play a simple clip for me. Let's see, can okay. we do it this time now? Come on, Eamon. I want people to hear this because it's very important. Um, Fiona Marie Flanagan is staying with us. 25 seconds. Here's Eamon Holmes. This is a time of national emergency. And um, as I know from myself at the start of all of this, you are not allowed to question... Uh, the narrative on, on, on such things. So there are restrictions on publications, there are restrictions on broadcasters, well, and there will be a lot of people it? saying that you are simply uh, rabble-rousing, you're creating panic uh, with all of this. Rabble-rousing at the time, he said to Denise Welch, well, it, there should be a national panic when the national media says we're, on, we're not allowed to challenge it. <laughs> That's a good reason to panic, you know? No, it really is. And actually, was it you um, who broadcast, I can't remember the lady's name, but there was someone in the UK actually said, in a similar vein, we're not allowed to give any airplay to anti-vaxxers, uh, that's even right. if they're right. Emma Barnett, BBC Radio 5 Live. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, picked, I picked that and up and I, I, I replayed it here. Right. Do you yeah. see this? Imagine this that. Crazy. I did, and Vernon Coleman went to town on it. Uh, yeah. Quite rightly. Even if they're right, we won't allow <laughs> anti vaxxers on. What do you need to do to get on the BBC? <laughs> oh, oh uh, this day and age, I really don't know, Richie. So, so no, it's just, it is madness over here. As I say, I, I know where we're going. I know what they're going to do, but, you know, broadly speaking, against the plan. And it's just day in, day out, seeing what, you know, the steps they're taking and how they're nudging us into this dreadful situation. What, what if James Connolly 
had said, Asher, ah, what can you do? We're stuck with it. What if Constance Markovic had said that? You know, what if I could go on and on? What if Michael Collins said, Asher, ah, look, we're stuck with the Brits. You know, let's get on with it. It's, it's so difficult for me as a genuinely proud Irish Republican to hear that our people, we're not any better than any other people in the world. We're not. But one of our characteristics is we do take quite a lot of shite, but we eventually blow and we say no more. And I don't know, maybe a part of me still hangs on to some hope that eventually we'll, we'll rise up. But another part of me thinks a lot of our young men and women in recent years have left the country, haven't they? They've gone, yeah. they've disappeared. And, yes. Yeah. And you're dealing with young, the young population concerns me. And, and I speak about my own children in there as well. You know, they're they're very liberal. They've been they've been brought up in that vein and they're they've been taught to be compliant. It's now I'm not speaking about everybody. And, and I wish, you know, my own would be a little bit more out there and, and speak their minds. But they're more afraid. They want to fit in. You know, they don't want to go against the grain, the narrative. Like, for example, you know, my daughter, they wear the face masks in school and she's managing to get through it. OK, but of course, I'm I'm worrying to bits every You're single human, day. Yeah. But she said, and I said, look, I can I can sort it out. I'll speak. I'll, I'll do whatever I can to try and get you even a visor, you know, a halfway house. And she said, no, I don't want to be different. And, you know, I can't force the child to be different. It's it's crazy. But that and what you're saying is that's the younger generation, the conformers, the TikTokers, the Instagrammers. They're all sharing photographs of themselves and face masks. It's wonderful. Their idols, their pop idols that they enjoy watching are all wearing face masks, telling them to wear face masks. So you can see the influencing factors that are coming through there. And then you have the rest of us old codgers, you know, my generation, your, your, your generation, Richie. And we're the ones that are agitating. We're desperately trying to mobilize support. And in fairness, I should give credit to, you know, the Yellow Vest. Health Freedom Ireland, especially Professor Dolores Cahill, yeah. Gemma O'Doherty, John Waters, and I'm missing out on a load who are organising protests and doing their best to gather people peacefully, you know, across the divide to try and unite left and right, because we're all united in this quest for freedom. It shouldn't really, it's not a, to me, it's not a political issue. No, it it's isn't. an existential issue, Richie. Um so there, you know, that people are desperately trying, but I, I just feel we're just not resonating. We're just not getting the traction, and the mainstream media play it down. You know, we were alt right, uh, fascist, Nazis. You know, all of that. Just libelous, we libelous. I mean, that's libelous stuff. You know, I've I've seen a lot of that nonsense, and uh, again, I come from a place when. I would have been a bit of a virtue signaller back in the day and I would have been shouting down, yeah. I would have maybe been shouting down people and, and, and accusing them of being on the far right. I, I mean, I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't be like the virtue signallers today, but I had my opinions at the time. But, but you live and learn. And uh, it is an existential crisis. It's not a political thing. Can I ask you briefly about um, Gemma? Has Gemma basically been kicked off pretty much all social media? Um, well, she's certainly been deplatformed from Twitter, Twitter and yeah. Facebook. She's active on Parlour, I believe, and she still broadcasts from her website. So she still does live streams. Um, but she's still, you know, she's going to uh, oh the Alternative View yeah. conference. You know that one that's being done in the UK. Are um, those are those people actually going to turn up and do it or are they going to do it virtually? Because some of those well, people have been very anti-lockdown. I'd like to think that they'll have some moxie and they might turn up to a hotel or can they not do that? I don't know now, Richie. I, yeah. I really haven't a clue about that. But, might not but be able you know, to any, it, yeah. any of Gemma's supporters, she is still active. I'd advise you just check in on her website and see her streams because she posts up some quite good stuff, certainly from the States, you know, that that particular angle in on... She's things. a very good analyst. I think she went down a dark hole with Trump, but that's just my personal opinion, but she's a very good analyst. But it's egregious, isn't it? I mean, you have the BBC the other day talking about how Facebook is going to delete um, as a matter of as a matter of um, policy from now on, anything to do with the QAnon thing. Now, look, I have probably a different opinion of QAnon than you. It doesn't matter. The last thing in the world I would ever accept or, or, or sanction is the deletion mm -hmm. of, of people's opinions. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an outrage. And of course, what that will lead, and you and I know this, Fiona, 
and the, the banning people talking about Q, which is a disgrace, will lead to banning people asking questions about the COVID lockdown. It'll lead to a ban on people talking about vaccines. Now, some of our listeners will say, oh, Richie, get with it. They're already kicking off that anti-vax, or not anti-vax, but vaccine concern pages. They might be, but they haven't yet announced it as a matter of policy. But they will be for too long. So whatever my opinions might be of anybody, I'm, mm. a com- I'm completely committed, 100%, to free speech for everybody, particularly for people whom I disagree with. I don't think the Q thing, I mean, I, I do believe in satanic paedophile rings. I mean, I, I've been talking about it for 12 years, long before a lot of people heard of it. I don't believe that Donald is some warrior for the truth, but that's just my opinion. It doesn't matter. I would not ban those people. It's outrageous. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. And listen, I completely agree with you. And, you know, just while while you're speaking about it, I, you know, I talk to friends a lot about the QAnon movement. I'm not a follower. You know, I, I'm not a, a believer in it as such. What I will say, though, is, as you have said, and I wasn't aware of the paedophile networks and the paedophile rings. I told you before, it was in one of your conversations, I think, with David Icke yeah. that I... I became aware of it to begin with, and that was just a few years ago. So I think from that perspective, QAnon has uh, awoken a lot of people. You know, they call it this great awakening. And to the extent that it's true, you know, whatever truth is coming out, I I think that's fine. But I worry, uh, uh, you know, that it's going to ultimately uh, lead people astray. That's just my take on it. And how it has kind of uh, aligned and gelled in with the Trump narrative, I'll hear I'll hear do a double take on you, Richie. I think taking QAnon down as a psyop on a psyop. In other words, <laughs> yeah. it's only fueling yeah. the the old conspiracy because yeah. they'll think, oh, that that's a win for us. See, if if it was if it wasn't true, they wouldn't bother taking us down. It must be true because we've been censored. Yeah, it's a brilliant take. You're, I think you're again you're spot on. It's pretty smart. <laughs> You know, you should, if you carry on like this, the, the elite will be knocking on your door for you and Marie Flanagan. Oh, you got some I ideas look, there, kid. Let's, uh, let's get you on board, you know. I look, I look under my car every morning, Richard. I, I don't look under them. I've got an old um, Renault Megane estate. They can blow that up if they want, but they, no, no, nobody's coming for me. You're listening to Fiona Marie Flanagan. She's with us. Is Fiona till six o'clock till the top of the hour. Really important, this. Um, the discussion, listening to Fiona talk about what's happening in, in Ireland and the complicity which is driving everybody mad at a time when it seems that more and more academics who are definitely telling the truth seemingly are getting at least into the press, into the newspapers. Is that a reason to be hopeful? That's the question, Fiona. I should have asked you that earlier on. If the print media is finally going to town on the lockdown, as the, I mean, the Daily Mail just went ballistic today, does that give you a little bit of hope? Yes, in a way. Yes, it does. Absolutely. Because obviously, the more people that wise up to this and understand that they're being duped at this particular juncture, you know, we I I believe it's quite clear, the better. But I say unto you, Richie, that obviously you you would you know that things are not quite that simple. And again, I then try and roll back and look at it more strategically as opposed to tactically. Tactically, it's great that people are 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 becoming aware. But what is the outcome then? What is the reaction? I fear that if people really, you know, if we come to food shortages, if if we are literally bolted down in this country and people are under distress with food and medications, let's just say, and they start taking to the streets, then we're talking martial law or some form of it. Now, obviously, our own army is depleted and a lot of people, a lot of decent people online have been talking about how they have been so badly treated in recent years, our armed forces in this country. So then you've got to ask the question, well, how would they supplement this? And I don't know whether you've seen, but recently there has been footage, I can't confirm it, of some um, military activity, UN type military activity in this country. Um, People have denied, oh, it's nothing on toward. It's just normal, you know. Don't be ridiculous. But normal. Yet it hasn't actually been verified as to what's going on. Yeah. So just to, just to get back to the point you're making, I say yes. Of course, we want people aware. But what will they start doing? Will they really start to get desperate and, and take to the streets in in a negative way, a really bad or violent way? That's what I hope won't happen because yeah. I don't want to play into. Um, because looking at the US, for example, it's it's easier, I think, to see there is I believe they're stirring for civil war, civil war of some description in some way or another. And I believe whatever the outcome of the 
election will be, one way or t other, you're going to head, you're going to have civil unrest. You're going to have unrest across the US. And I fear the US is coming down. Very, very so good. Look, you're right. Yeah. Very, very good. We're three, we're 27 days away from that election. Oh, both sides are know. saying that they'll contest. They're more or less both sides saying that they'll contest the outcome. I, I, again, I think you're spot on. There will be, to be very, you know, crass about it, let me be crass, there'll be murders after that. That's going to cause a storm unlike anything we've seen in recent years yeah. in terms of taking to the streets. Well, 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 well noticed that. Yeah, no doubt about that. Absolutely, Richie. And I mean, I, could, I know we don't have the time, but I could get into, I fear, I pray for America. Because to me, if America topples, that's the West gone. You know, it's just, a, to me, it's like the domino effect. And it's almost like that's, that's the way things appear to be moving. Yeah. The West is under severe attack with this. Because I have people in the Middle East, Richie, that I, I speak to, and they're going out for dinner. You know, I know someone who tomorrow night's in the Middle East going out to for a lovely Lebanese meal with their friends. Yeah. You know, this is yeah. this is crazy stuff. I know it. I know and, and they are, you know, on the face of it, supposedly police states to begin with. But that's why I feel they haven't been as uh, under a severe attack as we have in the West, because they had a lot of work to do to try and get us used to being monitored and surveilled and controlled and compliant to the extent that we seem to be right now. Everybody I speak to around Salford, we don't get into, I don't get into the real grim stuff with people. I really don't do that. But I ask little questions, you know, like this morning I was walking around the park and uh, luckily enough it stayed dry. We've had, we've been deluged with rain and I, was, I spoke to a couple of people. We met Tony, one or two other people I know. And I asked them about, you know, their habits changing and things they're doing. And to a person they were saying, well, we're, we're getting nearly everything now from Amazon, including mm -hmm. groceries. Imagine that. So now you have I'm the likes of the big supermarkets, right? They're looking now thinking, wow, you know, Amazon are going to come in here and they're going to do the weekly shop. They've got the logistic capability to do it. And the vast majority of the people, Amazon are saying now, we'll get you a shopping on the same day. Forget about any queues or don't worry about booking the time slot. Just order it in the morning We'll get it to you. That's where we're going. I mean, it's madness to me. I can't comprehend it. I no, really can't. I can't either. And I mean, such is the fabric of our society. And we know what the problems were. You've analysed them very well on your shows. Um, societal problems right now. But this is the end of an era. This is the crash and collapse of a civilization we are witnessing now. We're living through it. I, you know, I'm struggling to think that we could have lived in an equivalent situation over history, Richie. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, again, I'm not exaggerating here. Yeah. This is monumental beyond belief what is going on. Now, you and I could argue the toss as to whether our so-called capitalist system was sustainable in any case. I happen to believe it wasn't. I happen to believe it was designed to fail. But what it is being replaced with is something that I think I couldn't have believed in my worst nightmares from what I am understanding and gathering is coming down the tracks, as I said, through all the, the, the publications, the World Economic Forum, the United Nations Agenda 2030. You know them. You've discussed them even your guests have. So, so yes, that's where we are, Richie. And it's, it's, it is dystopian in the extreme. And they know, you know, I know that the end game, they want us here in our homes, telemedicine, teleshopping, teleeducation, yeah. teleentertainment, teletravel. And that's, that's, and that is horrifying because it just sucks everything that is worthwhile about life from us and deprives us of living. We'll get into that next time you're back. We'll get into where it's all going. Because I know I do speak about that with um, other guests. Of course I do. But you'll have a different take and you'll take it in a different direction, uh, Fiona. So next time you come back, let's talk about that, where it's um, you know meant to go, where they want to go. Alison McDowell was on the programme with me the other day. Really interesting lady. She's done some great work on this. And she described what you described and reckoned all of that, you know, the tele-education, staying indoors all the time and ultimately putting a suit and a helmet on and our avatars going off to do whatever we want to do, our travel, our, our entertainment. And um, I think she's bang on, as are you. Folks, Fiona is on Twitter. I know for many of our listeners, you know who she is. She was on the programme before, you know her anyway. But it's at Fiona M. Flanagan 1, at Fiona M. Flanagan 1. Um, great to have you on, Fiona. You're welcome back anytime. 
Thank you, Richie. And God bless. Keep doing your great work and hopefully I'll catch up with you soon. Can't wait, Fiona. Thanks for your time. Love speaking with Fiona Marie Flanagan. Great lady in Dublin. Love you have an Irish woman on the programme. It really is. It's uh, coming up to the top of the year. And speaking of great Irish women, I've asked Jean-Anne to come back on. Uh, Jean-Anne's a great, great friend of mine and um, a word I don't use lightly. A wonderful, wonderful woman. Vastly experienced woman. And I did say to her a week or so ago, come back on. And she was very keen to do it. We might try and make that happen next week. Uh, I know she's busy at the moment. So let's hope we, we, we uh, arrange that. Well, I'll be joined by Dean Henderson very shortly. And I know a lot of you are excited about that. Uh, he's written some amazing books and was very kind over the years to send me a copy of all of them. A fantastic writer. He really is. Dean Henderson and his wonderful wife, Jill. Great, great activists, great workers, great researchers as well. Before we go anywhere else then, thanks uh, to you for tweeting. Lots of tweets came in while I was speaking with Fiona. Thanks for them. To follow what people are tweeting to me, go to twitter.com where it says search Twitter. Just key in Richie Allen Show, all one word. Renowned healer Mark Bayerski travels the world to find the most unique and powerful crystals for self-healing. Since the ancient times, crystals have been used as healing tools. They hold a natural healing vibration and are highly charged in positive energy. Mark teaches how to channel the universal energy and transfer it to the crystal to activate its healing power. Each crystal is used for its unique ability to target a different physical or emotional challenge. Mark Bayerski is an author, healer, speaker, and founder of the Pure Energy Healing Academy. He shares powerful messages of inspiration and healing on his daily YouTube videos, reaching millions worldwide. Mark's crystals, healing oils, and incense sticks are most sought after by other healers. His collection is available online at www.markbyersky.com. His work is presented through Lemon House a company that creates and curates consciously made gifts. Now, the wonderful Mark Boyerski was on this programme on Monday and at the very end of it, he very generously said that he had a collection um, of of crystals and artefacts that he's had in his possession for many, many years and that he would auction them, effectively he would raffle them with the proceeds going to the Richie Allen radio show. He's an amazing guy to do that. And anybody sending a five pounds donation or any kind of donation this week would go into the draw. I think tomorrow, Friday, we'll, we'll, I'll be on top of this tomorrow on social, social media, I'll let you know. So thanks uh, to Mark for doing that. It's wonderful. And it's brought in several hundred pounds in, um, in revenue for the programme, which is marvellous and much needed as well. So markpayerski.com, that's the website. Terrific guy, the founder of um, the, the Pure Energy Healing Academy in Spain. I probably said that wrong now. Uh, let me just double check on that because I don't want to do that. I don't like being wrong. I'm wrong so often you might think you, you should be used to it, Richie. Yeah, the Pure Energy Healing Academy in Spain. And I know some people personally who've been to that academy to work with Mark and wax lyrical about it. So thanks to him for that. Somebody will win that. It's a beautiful collection of crystals and other memorabilia that Mark has put together that he's had in his possession for many years. All uh, for the Richie Allen radio show and he, he does that and he, he supports the independent media uh, so well done to him the conference mentioned by Fiona will apparently have have to be virtual and uh, that's understandable if hotels of course are complying with these guidelines it's basically impossible isn't it to have conferences and things like that today so that conference you know how I feel about conferences it's not just that one I have no time for them and I've given you my reasons many times over the years. It doesn't matter. It's not personal. I have no interest in them. But anyway, it'll be virtual, apparently. Right, it's three, nearly four minutes past the hour. You are listening to the Richie Allen Radio Show. It is live. It always is live, Monday to Thursday at five o'clock UK time from Salford in the great, great state of Manchester, the great county of Greater Manchester. Lancashire, Lancashire's the county, you see. Salford, yes. Uh, A week on Saturday, Salford Red Devils will play in the Challenge Cup final for the first time in 51 years. They will play Leeds. I know some people in this wonderful city who are thrilled to bits about it and they are biting their fingernails. Will we be allowed to travel to Wembley to enjoy ourselves as a, as a city, to watch our team? It's disgusting this, isn't it? It drives me mad even talking about it. Eh? Barry Hearn. Snooker, legend. Well, he never played snooker. 
but the boss of World Snooker, former manager of Steve Davis, Jimmy White and many others, has been tweeting out today saying that businesses are going to be ruined, irretrievable, will not be able to get businesses back if something is not done. Mentioned Jean Anne a moment ago. She's provided me with a wonderful quote from Podrick Pierce. One of the last things, maybe a, 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 a quotation from the last thing he wrote. Podrick Pierce, great Irish patriot. Listen to this. A nation is knit together by natural ties. Ties mystic and spiritual, human and kindly. An empire is at best held together by ties of mutual interest and the worst by brute force. The nation is the family in large. An empire is a commercial corporation in large. The nation is go God, the empire of man, if it not be of the devil. Pretty prescient at the time, says Jean Ann. And wouldn't Podrick Pierce, Porrick Pierce, wouldn't... Uh, all of these people that we mentioned, Markovic, whom Gene Ann played brilliantly last year, wouldn't uh, James Connolly, wouldn't uh, Larkin, wouldn't they all be spinning in their graves at what's happening in Ireland now? That great romantic country, that great revolutionary country of Ireland. Dean Henderson will be with me in a minute. I can't wait to catch up with him on Thursday's Richie Allen Radio Show. Welcome to the programme. All the new listeners tuning in. Lovely to have you with us. I hope you'll stick around. Albert Hammond, it never rains in Southern California. Welcome back to the program. Dean Henderson is a hugely popular and successful author, researcher, broadcaster, public speaker, and all-round terrific bloke. Uh, his books, I, I can't say enough about them. He was kind enough over the years to send me his books um, read them. I mean, today a number of people were talking on Twitter about Nephilim Crown 5G Apocalypse, which came out last year. It's a terrific read. Wow. And, you know, thinking it came out in June of 2019 or maybe May of 2019. And I, 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 I can tell you, the book was prophetic. Not pathetic, prophetic in its um, predictions. Dean Henderson, welcome back to the programme. Lovely to have you back. It's been too long. And... I know, I know now that Salford Red Devils will try will triumph against Leeds at Wembley because we got to go Red Devils from Dean Henderson on Skype. We're surely going to triumph in 10 days' time. Welcome back, mate. Lovely to have you on. Yeah, it's in the bag, Richie. It's in the bag now. That's an omen. <laughs> that is an omen, mate. That is an omen. So much of what you wrote last year has come to um, pass now. You're in a bit of a storm there at the moment, aren't you, with the vice presidential candidate debates, Trump um, and COVID, and uh, Trump saying today that he wouldn't do a virtual debate next week, he wouldn't have it, and all of that. It almost, I mean, we we're going we're to talk about COVID-19, of course, and 5G and everything else, but it almost seems that somebody is dialing up the chaos, like every day, just to see how much will these suckers take before they eventually storm the castle, Dean? What do you think? Yeah, as I said earlier, I think this is, the, the, at the base of all of this, it's kind of like a beta test of the hive mind and uh, how confused and obedient and uh, conformist have they made people through their social media, internet weaponry. It's all a distraction, you know, the whole election, it's a distraction. But, it, yeah, when they start talking about continuity of power, you know, with Trump getting COVID and things like that, really makes you wonder what is going to happen <clears throat> on Election Day. And uh, But more than anything, yeah, it's just a distraction. I mean, the whole process uh, that we're under right now um, is, is just a continual movement to the right on the political spectrum. They're washing it in green. They're washing it in red now. You know, we're, we're supposed to believe this is some kind of a, you know, a socialist takeover, according to, you know, the Fox News crowd. And, you know, on the other hand, we're supposed to believe Biden is a socialist or something like this. But it's all just moving to the right. And, and this fourth industrial revolution that they're using COVID to bring in, um, they need it to bring it in, is... Uh, is it's, it's hyper capitalism it's beyond that it's british mercantilism we're going back to we really are going back to to those old uh british mercantile east india company days 
Um, and this time, of course, they have the technology and the algorithms to make it even more uh, brutal and more precise. But you're going to be uh, looking at, uh, you know, Internet piecework. There's not going to be any more real jobs soon. That's why the gig economy, you know, it's supposed to be a cool thing to have, you know, be a gig. And all this stuff, it's all leading to that. And uh, yeah, this Allison McDowell that uh, I know you had her on your show the other day, she's really been hitting the, the nail on the head on this stuff because, you know, that's what it's all about. It's about opportunity zones for Goldman Sachs. It's about the further privatization of the welfare state, further pr public private partnerships, all these buzzwords that we've been hearing about, which are all part of Agenda 2021 20, and 2030. And, and it, but, but that's the whole thing. It's all marketed as this kind of, we're going to save the environment, you know, with Extinction Rebellion and all these lunatics. So we're going to save, we're going to do social justice with BLM. And, and what it is, it's a smokescreen behind which hide the, hides the most brutal form of capitalism you'll ever see on this planet. And it's all about getting inside our bodies and we become the commodity, the human capital bonds. It's not a petroleum standard anymore. It's a human standard. And it's all about, you know, Goldman Sachs betting within that opportunity zone in South Philly or whatever. You know, are you going to make it or not? They make money either way. And this is the derivative. It's another derivatives trade, which is all, again, from the city of London. Blockchain, we know, is 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 emanating from the same uh, mindset of, of the city of London, this dark pool of, you know, you can't trace it. You can't track it. And, oh, so many people got caught up in that one. They thought, you know digital currency was going to be our savior and it was going to get us away from the Fed. And, and now we find out the central banks are the ones coming out with the digital currencies. Of course they did. They just worked these kids to get the thing down and then they stole it from them. So it's all enslavement. Blockchain is untraceable. It's part of the colonial crown project. Um, and it emanates from the same place, from the city of London crown corporation. Um, we find out things more every day about how even British American tobacco, another crown company is involved with the, tobacco mosaic virus being a big part of these vaccinations. We're farming out everything in a further privatization, even the vaccination programs over here, which under Operation Warp Speed, which is all a military program, are going to be administered by third party private, another contractor for a contractor. Uh, Emergent Biosolutions is one of them. It's headed by this psychopath ex, uh, you know, insider with the NSA who ran the North Korea and Iranian desks. And, and, you know, we're already hearing about forced vaccinations in Australia, how the fact that Aussies can't travel now until 2021. And so this is just a, a medieval uh, feudalist lockdown of the planet, you know, marketed as a socialist revolution and an environmental, you know, revolution. And behind, like I say, behind it, which the biggest wealth grab in the world is taking place. They've taken four trillion dollars and added it to the debt of the United States by using the public sector to pay for everything. Yeah. Um, we're even going to pay the military. We're going to pay the military to, to, to farm out the vaccinations for yeah. Pfizer, for AstraZeneca, for GSK. You know, they don't, they're not going to pay for that. We're going to pay for that. If everybody gets injured and they will, then we're, they're not going to pay for that because of the vaccine courts that have already been set up. We're going to pay for that. So they've got this public private partnership thing just in a in, right where they want it. So the public pays for everything and the private partnership profits from everything. But that's not socialism, my friend. And that's what's so galling about this whole process of what's going on is both sides of the, the red, you know, the red cheerleaders and the blue cheerleaders over here. None of them see what's happening, which is a, a, a big time lurch to the right into this just this fascism, uh, which now has this heavy dose of technology in it and makes it much more deadly, much more efficient. There, there are a couple of questions coming in about Bitcoin as you mentioned, blockchain, Be before we go there, thanks for mentioning Alison McDowell. I didn't know anything about Alison. Alison reached out. Somebody told her to reach out. This is the thing when you work alone, you know how it is yourself. Uh, great people, you can miss them. But she got in touch and Alison did a very good job of explaining what you explained about derivatives and financial products. And I'm not patronizing her, she did, but it, it still went over the heads of the vast majority of the audience. They couldn't get their heads around it. And I covered the manufactured financial crash of 2008, and I drilled myself into learning the terminology and understanding what was going on. She did a great job of explaining it, but people still can't get their heads around it. That we, as in me and you, we are meant to be turned into an exotic financial product that can be traded 
by these lunatics. You know, people can make bets on us or against us. And I, I tried to explain it to a friend of mine the other day and he couldn't get his head around it either. But this is where it's all leading, this fourth industrial revolution, isn't it? Yeah, and it's no wonder people can't get their heads around. Oh. It's just so bizarre. And um, and it really is a war uh, between, you know, it's a war on the natural world. And what we've been experiencing for the last 8,000 years, you know, Richie, since the Anunnaki intervention in uh, Samaria is, is it just that. It's a, it's a war on the natural world, a war on natural law. And the British maritime law, which the Crown deploys, which blockchain falls under, the Admiralty law is is what really has uh, has has leaned tilted the balance towards the Luciferians who are at war with creation, because it gives them a legal cover uh, in the court system. Although if people know their common law and their natural law, apparently they are able to to supersede that. But yeah, I mean it's it's just so far out that it's no wonder people can't understand that. I mean, who would have thought yeah. that that could happen? That first they would enslave us into agriculture. In Samaria, then they would enslave us with this industrial uh, steam revolution in Europe, and then they would enslave us with this oil uh, industrial revolution. And then that now, yeah, we're actually talking about humans, uh, the commodity, yeah. and uh, it's pretty far out. But you know, these people uh, they're unhinged, and um, I really my my gut feeling is that this is all going to fall on its face, um, honestly, because I don't think they have the the technology down, and I just think there's a lot more powerful forces out there working against them, mainly creator and creation. And, uh, but it is, you have to look at it as that sort of a battle. I wouldn't say it's a spiritual battle. I don't like that word spiritual. Uh, that was their creation too, but I think it's a battle between nature and, and virtual reality, you know, natural law versus, versus basically a bunch of phonies yeah. who are trying to hijack, uh, reality and create a hologram, uh, reality, a holographic reality that that doesn't really exist and then just they use the screens of course and 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 the the computer screens the tv screens the phone screens to keep people you know addicted to that to that virtual reality is sort of tuned into that if you turn the tv off covid 19 doesn't exist or yeah. you turn the internet off it doesn't exist right? brilliant brilliant so, point yeah yeah hey listen dean what what i have you um, and Dean's going to stay with me till the top of the hour and I'm, I'm so glad to have him back on. You should come back on more often. I always tell you that. I, um, I work alone. You should get in touch more often. There isn't anybody outside of maybe David, uh, to give David his due, one or two others I could mention, Jim, of course, Jordan. Um, when you're getting into the esoteric nature of this, when you're getting into the um, technological aspect of it and where it's meant to go, Dean Anderson is right up there with anybody I've ever spoken to. I recommend you read his books. Um, I, I can't recommend them highly enough. Feel free now to tell me to feck off because I'm going to be a little bit critical of common law. I hear this all the time and some of my listeners, they get really annoyed with me and they send me emails that are pretty, you know, they don't pull any punches in the emails. But what it is about common law, I, I've had people on over the years and of course I, I listen to them and I think they make a lot of sense. They're very well read up. And they convinced me nearly. The problem is, you're dealing with a court system, aren't you, Dean, in this country that's run by people, some of them with satanic notions or satanic leanings or tendencies. I think you go into court here in the UK or the US and bring your common law all you like. Well, these people don't have to say, all oh, right, you're, you're right there, Dean, sorry about that. Mate, listen, you can keep your house and, and move on. You know what I'm saying? And I don't want to be an asshole yeah. about this, but I keep, I can't get my head around that. No, you're right. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't put myself in that position, or, or, you know, because I don't, I don't, I don't trust it either. Just simply because, you know, in, in a courtroom in America, if you walk into a courtroom, it's the, the American flag is, is, uh, you know, it's got a border of gold around it. And that, signifies that you're entering into a contract with the British maritime law right away, yeah. you know, and bar association, which accredits all our lawyers here, that's British accredited Regency. So, and it comes off from the temple bar, the Knights Templar, da, 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 da. So I have no faith in that either. I, I just, that's why I say, apparently you can supersede it because yeah, yeah. I sure as hell wouldn't try it in America or, or any of the crown controlled countries, Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand, whatever the Commonwealth, um, maybe if you really knew the, the details of it, um, I, I mean, I think, you know, if you knew the right words or if you knew the right 
you know, way yeah. to do it, maybe. But uh, Maybe. I should but, be yeah, more well, open-minded. I should be more open-minded. Look, what it is is, I can just imagine some judge, you know, you go in there. Of course, common law, when you read it, I've had David Shaler on over the years, other people who know this stuff by rote, you know, really smart men and women. And I just see these arsehole judges with their wigs saying, yeah, that's all lovely. Take him down. You know, that's lovely. Yeah. Take him down. But look, that's just me being maybe, maybe yeah. being an arsehole. Dean Anderson is on. Dean, uh, Bitcoin. Here's the question now. A number of people asked me to put this to you. Uh, about Bitcoin. And the question is, let me bring it up there. Why are so many people advocating Bitcoin? Is it not bypassing the bank system? And, is, and, and you know, is it being used by folks already? We hear a lot about Bitcoin, the pros and the cons of it. What's going on with it? I wouldn't be trading in it. I don't have any and I'm not sure it's going to do me any good. What do you think? Well, the whole thing is 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 now controlled. I mean, you've got Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase. All the big banks have been buying up all these these uh, these blockchain, you know, Bitcoin type companies. You got Bitcoin itself being traded on Wall Street. I mean, I don't know. You'd have to be pretty naive to believe this was somehow getting around the Fed or getting around Wall Street or, you know, getting around anything. And um, you know, there was a company called uh, Digital Solutions. I talk about it in my last book and all the stuff that they've bought up and, and all the <clears throat> applications. But see, blockchain is the <clears throat> is the key. And it, it, you know, if you think about it, it's a block and chain on your leg. It's, it's it's like you're in jail. And but it's really the key because the city of London, if you think about it, when everything went off the rails was in this country, it was during the Clinton Bush years when and Tony Blair, I'd say on your side of the pond, because he deregulated even further the city of London. Yeah. And what Bush and Clinton did was they allowed corporations to move their stuff offshore. This is when all the free trade agreements, you know, that was the, the thing of the day. Everybody wanted to do free trade agreements and create the WTO and GATT and all that stuff. So that allowed U.S. corporations for the first time in history, they could take their money offshore and they could put it into the city of London, into, your, into a euro dollar, they call it, which is just a dollar that trades outside anywhere outside the U.S. It's called a euro dollar. But once you get into that dark pool of money, there's no regulation. It's very opaque. And this is where all the drug money, all the uh, oil money, all the arms money, the human trafficking money, it all goes through the city of London which, and, and through the offshore network, which is run out of the city of London by the Bank of England and in numbered accounts, which only they know the owners of. And this is why the crown's able to hide its vast wealth. And people actually believe the bullshit that, it, you know, Jeff Bezos is the richest man in the world or something like yeah. this. But so they, the blip, the, if you look at the blockchain, it's the same kind of thing. It's it's very dark. It's you're talking about the dark web. You're talking about kind of an underworld, which is exactly where the the mafia and it, it is a mafia. The, the mafia is the bankers. The bankers are the mafia. It's it's no you know the city of London is the global mafia. And it, just to be clear, and so all the intelligence agencies work for the banks. They don't really work for countries. They work for the banks. Even even to the point where it's bloodlines, you know, dad was a banker, so Sonny's going to be in the CIA yeah, or, or yeah, vice yeah. versa, depending on their intelligence level. So this whole thing is a trap. And, and they're just basically it's all about moving towards a digital global currency, which Mark Carney talked about, member of the committee of 300, just below the council on 33 and the bloodline 13. And, and Mark Carney was talking about it last year in Jackson Hole before COVID. And then you have the repo window opening in September in this country um and you knew right then there was going to be an economic uh, collapse because the you know jp morgan was lending money to goldman at you know 15 percent, and everybody kind of their ears went up and what's going on and and so the bottom line is this thing was going to crash anyway the, the end of this phase of capitalism was apparent they couldn't really monetize anything else um the the people were getting tired of war um and, and so now instead of fighting a war between china and the u.s Forget about it. It's, it's, it's just a smokescreen. There's no more nation states going to be fighting because now the war on terror has been turned into a war on all humanity. And and it's going to be a thing where, where they had to crash the other economy. They knew it was going to go anyway. So they're like, they're like, well, let's do the Great Reset. Let's let it crash. Let's When we do it, we'll lock it down. We'll knock out all these small businesses. We'll, we'll bring in this digital blockchain currency, which we've been allowing these little tech geeks to work up and Get all excited about maybe some of them made some money in the first round that happens it happens with amway okay so 
But but the bottom line is it all had to happen. Even the riots in the streets, they're gutting out the inner cities. They're they're smashing small business. They're smashing infrastructure. Perfect. Bill Gates is building a brand new city in the Phoenix, in the desert outside of Phoenix. It's a smart city. That's what they want. They kind of want to start from scratch because they have to put all this 5G infrastructure into and 6G and everything else into these cities to make them smart cities. So it's all intentional by design and, and it's all a distraction from the class war, which the 1% oligarchy has declared on us for 8,000 years. And we're supposed to fight among races, among genders, among countries, among anything they can get us to fight about. It's the oldest trick in the book, divide and conquer. So I think the digital is, is a trap. And I, I think in the end, um, it's, it's, it's just going to be actually very, not just a part of the Fed system, but it will be the Fed system. I mean, we even saw in the stimulus this last round when they tacked four trillion under our debt, um, you know, that, that they were talking about, you know, doing digital payments to people. And that kind of went down in Congress because there was some opposition, but, but that's definitely the idea of what's coming here. So I don't know. It just seems to me like it's part of the plan instead of, uh, uh, you know, a block in the way of the plan. And this war on humanity, you summed it up there, I think. It, it's basically man against man, brother against brother, brother against sister on the basis of the most, you know, inane things like identity, mm -hmm. you know. And, yeah. and, and, and then they bring in this invisible enemy. Are you really interested in the language being used by politicians on both sides of the pond, the language being used to describe COVID, you know, a battle against this evil disease, a battle against this silent killer that's disrupted our lives. It's constant, day in, day out, you know, the virus is destroying your lives. It's the virus that's doing it. And people seem to be going along with it rather than thinking, well, no, it's you that's doing it, you bastard. It's not the virus at all, but people are buying it. And they're going along with it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting to hear. I was listening to your show yesterday and you guys were talking about uh, build back better. Somebody yeah. said, Boris said, build. Well, that's that's the exact campaign slogan for Biden. It's James on all the yard signs. And what? what that means is 5G, smart cities. I mean, that's what I'm saying. They, they, they intentionally destroyed this economy and now they're going to build it back better. Because that's part of the global reset and they have to have it and not only that but of course they'll wipe out all this competition from small businesses which the yeah. cartels love it and so you know this again this is just capitalism global capitalism a globalization process now with this algorithm driven technology which is very precise and efficient and expedient and barbaric and, and, and it's it's just going to, again, it's going to accumulate even more wealth into the hands of, of the few. Um, we're already in a situation where we have, you know, a billionaire president, a billionaire cabinet. That's never happened in the history of, of this country. And, and it, they're, so they're coming out in the open. They can just come out in the open. They can do commercials on TV and brag about, you know, how, just about anything. Uh, is that right, Dean? Is that, pedophilia, I mean. Yeah, is that right? The entire cabinet are billionaires to a man and woman? More world. or less. More or yeah, less, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and um, so, it, so, so to me, Trump is the oligarchy. I mean, there's the gloves are off. There's no more hiding it. Here we are. Here we are to, to be your president, to, to run your country. Officially, we don't even have to hide behind you know, lobbyists anymore. We're just going to run it directly. But millions, and, and but again, millions of people. Sorry to interrupt you. Dean Henderson is our guest. Great to have him on. Millions and millions of people seemingly believe that he's an undercover agent fighting the forces of darkness from his command centre in the Oval Office. He's bringing down satanic paedophiles. Now, everybody knows that I think that's preposterous to say the very least. But you can't get away. The guy is nakedly blatantly a arch neocon Zionist, or at least controlled as such. Um, he's been the best they've ever had, the people behind this agenda. And by people, we mean, of course, bankers and industrialists and, and the people we've talked about in the past. And yet he's, his fans believe, and they are legion, seemingly, he's a crusader against satanic paedophiles. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. Um, when <laughs> Wilbur Ross, you know, his commerce secretary, who... You know, the Commerce Department is where Circo ha uh, it, it has the contract. Again, the contracts, the British system of privatization, mercantilism, contract everything out, contract your military out, contract everything. And so Wilbur Ross presides over this Commerce Department where Circo has the contract to, to administer the patent office. So they're, they're basically uh, 
lo looking over all the 5G patents and then farming them out to their corrupt crony corporations, just stealing them off and oh, stealing, stealing them from yeah. people like Leader Technologies. And and you have uh, the fact that Wilbur Ross was the, the bond, the head bondsman, you know, bond trader at Rothschild Inc. when Trump got bailed out of the Taj Mahal. And so he owes him a lot of money. His debts are actually coming due at the end of this year. And there's some people think that he might just have to declare bankruptcy, but he owes him money. OK, so bottom line. And plus, he was on Epstein's plane just with Clinton, too. So, I mean, I, he is a pedophile. How can you fight pedophilia if, when you're part of the ring? And how come you move the capital of, you know, to Jerusalem? And how come you're pushing the vaccination? And how come, you know, so just last week when he got COVID, and of course the other side's so disgusting because they're just like, we want him to die. And they're horrible. There's yeah, nothing liberal yeah, yeah, about yeah. that. There's nothing yeah. progressive about that. There's nothing socialist about that. They're just, again, they're the fake left. I always call them the fake left because that's what they are. They're, they're not left. They're just little capitalists. Um, and then they like to whine and like to be victims and they like to, you know, get their feelings hurt. But the, yeah. what, what the hell is socialist about that? You, socialists, when you and I were growing up, Rich, you were tough suckers, man. Yeah. You know, we worked hard. You had to work hard, man. You, you didn't sit there and take crumbs from the state. You didn't want crumbs from the state. You didn't want any of this crap. You didn't want a $1,200 check. You wanted, to, you wanted to own the factories. You know, you wanted some real serious power. You wanted land reform. You wanted big things like that. Um, so there's nothing. So they're so disgusting that, you know, and that's why Trump was perfect this time around for the crown who put him in there through Cambridge Analytical clearly um, was because he was the response to the political correctness, which they also brought in to destroy the real left and just fragment it and make it just kind of hot air with no action. No. And all about what you say it and what you say instead of what you do. And so perfect. You bring this reality TV guy who say, well, we're going to take your brand. You get the casinos. We'll get the Atlantic City boardwalk and we get your brand. We get the Trump brand. So Trump is a brand. Trump is in there as a brand and he's fooled the alt right because, oh, yeah, he was going to investigate 9-11. He was going to investigate the Fed. I haven't seen it. And and so he just fooled him with his brand. And when Trump says, go get vaccinated, guess what? All these right wing yahoos who are, used to be against vaccinations, they'll trust it. It looks so like they have here. This all figured out. It they have this all figured, all figured out. Algorithms. out. It looks like here and in your country, it looks like a vaccine might be ready to distribute to key workers before Christmas. Let me go back to one thing. I don't often get a chance to have a pop at you because I like you. I love you and uh, your, your books. But it's unfair, I think, for anybody. To, to label Trump a paedophile. We don't know that. Now, I know that he's been very free with his hands over the years, and I know and I believe that there are many women with legitimate complaints against him that could have gone further. And I know that he was buddies with Epstein, and it's going to sound like I'm being naive, and it's going to sound like I'm scared of being sued for libel. I'm not, because Donald Trump is never going to sue me for libel, because I don't have any money, number one. Um, and he wouldn't anyway. But um, I'm not sure that you know, we can call, or we should call Trump a paedophile. Even Bill Clinton, whom I'd be, I'd have a lot more interest now in Clinton and Epstein than Trump. That's all I'm saying. We we don't know that he's ever molested children, is all I'm saying. Yeah, true enough. True enough. Um, but anyway, I, I think I think the QAnon thing and all that stuff, it's just, it's again, it's a psyop from the NSA to keep the Trump people at bay. They did the same thing with Obama, you know, he was the first black president, so if you're... Yeah. You know, progressive. You were supposed you to, to just love that. Be, be gaga <laughs> about him just because yeah. he was black, and and I kind of fell into that trap maybe at first too, because it was a cool thing for our country to have a black president. But then you realize he's just going to drag Gaddafi behind the jeep, and he's going to you know invade Syria, and he's going to screw around in Ukraine, and, and then you don't like him anymore, and you realize it was all a ruse. But I hope that the people behind Trump realize the same thing because we're never going to fix this if we stay in these stupid camps of stupidity where. You know, you're cheering for for the bad guys. I mean, either either way you look at it, with it's Biden or with it's Trump, you're cheering for the bad guys. But I gotta say this too: I think that the guy this time for the for the crown is Biden, because now you've you've got the the blowback from the PC and Trump, and Trump, that was Trump, and so all his people kind of got it out. And yeah, we can say whatever we want now. We don't have to be politically correct. Well, now you need a guy, guess what, that wants to just listen Take to the, the other scientist, way. Richie. You know? wow. So that's Biden. So it's all, that's all he ever says. Well, I'll just listen to the scientists. Well, who are the scientists? Well, they're those people that hide behind science but aren't scientists. That's who they are. And we have all actually the science on our side 
um, all we need about how dangerous masks are and about how they shouldn't have locked us down and about how they, they should have let the young people get herd immunity and, and, and then protected the old people more as the Barrington Declaration states. And we've got all that science on our side, but they continue to say that the, I guess, basically big pharma is science is what yeah, they're telling us. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And so Biden's their guy now and Biden will mask everybody up and, and he'll, he'll go all Australia and New Zealand on us. And stuff like You're that. You're calling so it for Biden. The establishment wants Biden. Dean to Henderson, folks, you heard it at exactly 24 minutes to seven on Thursday, the 8th of October 2020. The very learned and brilliant Dean Henderson believes that Biden is the next chess move by those pulling the strings. Hugely interesting you saying that because before you came on, um, Fiona Marie Flanagan was on with me and Fiona reckons that whatever happens the chaos that will follow the election result might be, well, even unprecedented. And if Biden was to win it, if you were to be right, Trump's fans, of course, those who believe that he is Q or that he's, you know, working with Q, they will, of course, immediately assume that he's been robbed, Dean. And then it's them. Mm -hmm. um, it's ding dong, right? It's crazy then. Yeah, that's that's very real possibility. The, the Demo well, not just the Democrats, the neocons and the neoliberals. So, some new, there's a lot of neoliberals involved. That there's also people like Bill Crystal involved with it. He's a neocon. They're the same people, really, right? So yeah. they've established this thing called TIP, which is Transitional Integrity Project, and they're actually talking about openly, yeah, that if Trump, cheat, you know, steals the election, that they'll they'll there's somehow there's going to be some intervention, you know, or whatever, and it could go the other way too. And I really think this is part of the BLM thing too. It's being funded by Soros. It's the CIA. Uh, they're putting black people into a vulnerable position right now. They're putting them in harm's way so that when there's backlash comes, uh, it could be ugly. It could be just an ugly race war. And and what better for the crown and the 1% than, again, just to distract us and, and, and to tear this country apart? Because, if again, yeah, if they can tear America apart, um, they can tear anybody apart. And they have to tear us apart, actually. Because, you know, for all the faults this country has, we still fought the bastards and, and we still continue to have our guns and we still, uh, can, you know, many states, at least, you don't have to wear a mask, yeah. and, including the one I'm in. And I wouldn't be in another state right now. I would not be in a mass state. I just I can't imagine. Uh, but, yeah, so it's I, I think that's a big concern uh, is a possibility of a civil war. I've been hearing now this story about this asteroid. You've probably heard it. You know, oh, yeah. Supposed to come Go on, talk 2nd. about that. Hey, listen, just before you do, let me remind our listeners, Dean Henderson is live on the Richie Allen radio show this Thursday. It's really good to have Dean on. Um, yeah, I mean, what you described there about the the chaos pulling us apart, and, and you, you talk there about people. I still believe that society is full of fundamentally nice people, decent people. I really do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if we could get away from blaming the Jews for everything, if we could get away from blaming Muslims for everything and just get out of our identity groups and get rid of them and realise mm -hmm. that, you know, there's not a little group of Jewish people. Uh, Jews are suffering it. Muslims are suffering it. Uh, Paddies like me are suffering it. We're all under the jackboot. And uh, it's the identity politics that you've described so well that have um, enabled them to take it so far. And you're right about the, um, these, the, these riots getting to the point where, and it, I mean, you told me several years ago on a program, you told me very early on in, in the lifetime of this program, you said to me, and I remember you saying it, I wish I could have, I wish I had the audio to hand. You said these race wars, Richie, eventually will be the catalyst for, or the excuse for the sort of police state that they really want to bring in. And, uh, yeah, you're absolutely bang on there, Dean. Uh, you know, we're seeing it here now. We have the army here already in, in the last... Uh, the, the Birmingham newspapers reported last week you have the army here helping the council go door to door to pass out COVID-19 tests. And people are just blissfully saying, ah, sure, there's the army, sure, no harm at all, you know. Yeah. It is, wow. it's serious. It's not... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's bad. The de the testing is a key part of it. Yeah. And because they they're, they're getting they're stealing people's DNA if you didn't go through ancestry.com or, you know, 23 and me or whatever. Now they're going to get your DNA. They're they're taking a taking it from the base of your brain and so the testing is, is just as big a part of the agenda as anything right now. 
because they have to feed it into the computers um, and they have to know that they're working on precision medicine, they call it, which is tailored to the individual, each person. Plus, of course, they can know your weaknesses if they want to take you out or, you know, if they want to deny you insurance or, you know, it's all about the social credit. If you're not healthy and you're smoking cigarettes, you know, we get back into what Allison McDowell's talking about where, you know, you'll you'll pay something with your debit card at the grocery store. And if you didn't buy an apple, you bought potato chips. Well, you won't get your nicotine patches next week from the, you know, medical people or whatever. You know, so it's all it's all going into that direction. And um, and and yeah, they have to further and further atomize and fragment people and and just split the world apart. The, it's all about just tearing apart reality in, into these little bits and these little pieces. Like think about a bit on your, on the computer, a computer bit, and they're just shattering uh, natural reality and natural law in favor of this atomization of. Uh, uh, and, and creation of virtual reality. So I'm actually uh, just started another book, um, and I'm going to call it Slow Loris, which is my cat's name. Go on. It, it's <laughs> it's going to be all about. Um, it's going to be all about just how we've been we've been pretty much trapped into our uh, our intellect at this point. And you you read the the Nephilim Crown book, and a lot of that book was about how they were doing that. It wasn't about COVID, but it was about they're going to be able to do some really big crisis because of what they're doing to people with the Internet and with just this overload of information. And the, the there's so many, you know, it does Carlos Castaneda, Henry David Thoreau, Yupensky, Gujarat, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, the Bible. I mean, all of the great you know works of our time, the great thinkers of our time have talked about this idea that. You know, you get trapped in your mind and you can't get out and and that's where fear lives and that's where neurosis lives and that that's where kind of cunning, evil, uh, you know, planning of, I'm gonna, you know, acquisitiveness and materialism and all that stuff lives there. And so instead of that, we, we need to have people outside. We need to have resonating with natural law. We need to have them observing and inferring, which is real science, you know, just observing and inferring, not going on these preconceptions like germ theory, like Big Bang theory, like, you know, evolutionary theory. These are all theories, but the crown had to put theory at the end so it wouldn't sue them when we found out they were lies because that's the way they think. They're a lizard brain. And and so all of this, this fake reality that the crown has created and then they pushed it with the screens, they pushed it with the TV, they pushed it with the Internet, they pushed it with the phones now. They pushed it with the newspapers, the radio, everything they've always controlled because they've always controlled the media because media is just the old, they used to call it black magic and then they called it propaganda and now they call it media. And so we got to we gotta find out again about reality and we have to remember who we are. A lot of it's just remembering where we came from, remembering why we're here and uh, not getting sped up. And that's the whole slow Loris deal is like everything is going too fast. And when you get into a frenzy or in a frenetic state, like you burn, you burn things on the stove or, or you, you bump into a car in front of you or you, you know, you treat your wife or your kid in a bad way. You holler at them because you got you got in a hurry. And, and this whole process, if you watch TV or, or, or anything, you'll just see that the whole process is to try to keep us sped up and shopping and, and not thinking and not not being OK, not being content, not being thankful for what we already have, wanting more. And this is really the, the mind parasite, that, that the mind virus that, that is at play here. We don't have a, a COVID-19 pandemic. We have a, a mental condition. We have a, a kind of a psychosis of humanity where enough of people would get, would get that scared and rattled just because the screen told them something that they would actually uh, lock themselves down with their ankle bracelet, which is your cell phone or your Fitbit or your you know, device, your device. Um, and that's really the, what we're dealing with. So that's, that's what I think gets us out of this is, is, is it's going to have to be the transformation of, of the entire society, but one person at a time of just becoming aware of natural law and going slow and being content and not wanting and not looking for more information. You know, there's a point where you don't need any more information really uh, especially from the internet or the computer, you just need to go outside and you just need to really relish in, in the in the creation that's in front of us, whoever made it. I mean, it, it's magical. It's all perfect. It's put together. Everything fits. And it's not this dystopian nightmare that, that is projected to us on the screen. 
from on high. And that's really the the war we're fighting here is, is a war of like regaining some semblance of just, you know, reality in, in the minds and hearts of man instead of going along with this virtual reality where everything's fake, contrived, uh, doesn't feel right. And doesn't feel right because it's not right. And it is Luciferian at its base. Um, they're openly, it, you know, talk about this and all the, the Freemason Bible of Albert Pike and just you know, over and over they talk about this, the biting of the taking a bite out of the apple in the Garden of Eden. We had it perfect and we didn't and we weren't content. So we took a bite out of the apple and, and here we are. And this is where it gets you. I mean, and, and the people running this show like Musk and Gates, they're just psychopaths. Didn't get enough love from their parents. Most of them um, had daddy issues, you know, whatever it was, mostly just didn't get enough love from their parents. And so now they're out there trying to prove themselves and how to prove how much smarter than God they are and how how they can make things better. The world's not good enough. We have to make it better. And, and then this goes back to all of our problems, whether it's alchemy or nuclear weapons or the splitting of the atom or just whatever. It's always been about not being content and then going along with these people who aren't content and then becoming discontent yourself and then spreading that discontent to your neighbors and family and friends. So that's the cycle. It just has to stop. And, and a lot of that is just slowing down. You know, being a turtle, just moving a little slower, just, you know, because when you move slow, you're harder to herd. I used to live on a ranch and we had to get, you know, herd cows into a pen or sheep and there'd always be some going kind of slow. And they didn't, you know, they made it kind of hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we need to be those slow sheep now that just at least slow down and don't be as eager to jump in the pen, I guess. What um, I wanted to ask you earlier on, we were talking about some of the characters involved is what is happening at the moment, is it a bit like the Manhattan Project? Is it really need to know basis? Is it, uh, how do, what, what do we say when we talk about Manhattan? We talk about um, how the vast majority of people involved didn't know what the end game was going to be. So you had people going to work in their thousands and they hadn't a clue that they were building a monstrosity that would murder so many people. Is this like that? You know, you got people in different political parties, mm -hmm. MPs. Surely they don't know where this goes. Surely they're just part of that. Compa that's the term. You would have said it now, compartmentalization. Yeah, that's right. No, that's right. That's how, they, that's how they do everything. Every project. Uh, they've learned that over the years that, you know, you just tell a per certain person to do a job and then he doesn't know that his job's going to dovetail into this other thing. And, and yeah, most, so most of them don't have any clue about the 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 evil that is behind the whole thing, putting it all together. But there is that evil, and um, and it, and I do think it has it has an off planet component for sure with the Nephilim uh, crown, and uh, because again they've been at war with this Earth ever since they got here, and they haven't given a damn about it. And you talk about yeah, we're gonna <laughs> climate change is their cover. For what they do but yeah meanwhile look at them cranking out the masks and just dirty masks everywhere just on the street and just they don't care they're just they're using like five hundred thousand. what did i say and i think it was five i can't remember the number but a bunch of sharks were going to be slaughtered to to get some oil for one of the vaccinations i heard and i mean they don't give a damn about nature they just they hate nature they hate everything about nature and they hate everything natural about us so they've made up this story about who we are to make us hate ourselves because if we hate ourselves and we hate nature by, by extension, we hate humanity. And then we'll become, you know, basically the next thing you know, you're carrying water for these people and you don't even know it. You don't even so know there's it. a lot of people in that situation who are just carrying water for the establishment and they don't even know it, whether it's just by panicking. Like one of the things happened here on the reservation, the Indians are getting money for COVID and they don't have any money. So they're, you know, they're always broke. And, and so they all of a sudden they roll out, they're going to give them all these millions of dollars. Well, next thing you know, the Indians have checkpoints up yeah, on the reservation. Yeah. So you take these these really great, you know, people who have this great old culture and you just, you tell them, okay, look, if you panic, we'll give you money. And a lot of this whole COVID thing, that's what it is. You know, if you panic, if you, if you, if you do a positive COVID test, 96% of the PCR tests are fall positives, but who cares? You get 13 grand for Humana Hospital or, you know, one of the three big hospital chains in this country, because that's what there is now. There's three. There's Aetna, there's Humana, and Healthcare. So that these corporations are cleaning up. 
on 13,000 each positive COVID test. And they're cleaning up when they put them on a, on a respirator instead of oxygen, which is what they should be doing if they want them to live. So it's a eugenics thing and they're just killing people. And and, and um, they really want to kill the old people. Yeah, because they're the creditors and that's who they owe money to. And that's who has the wisdom and the knowledge to maybe stop this crazy stuff that's going on. They oh, if we listen to, well said, well said, if we listen to our senior citizens, they would be, saying, and I know this because we do hear from um, older members of our families, they think this, they are aghast at this, they think it's ludicrous, they think it's soul-destroying, they don't want any part of it. You're, you're, you're quite right to say that. What Dean mentioned there about the sharks is right, he's right to say that. They want squalene, and I've looked this up while Dean has been talking, I don't want to sound like I'm very intelligent, because I'm not. I looked it up while Dean was talking. They want squalene from the livers, of sharks and conservationists reckon that um, they'll kill a half a million sharks to race to produce a vaccine that nobody needs. It's beyond psychotic. That level of carnage is beyond psychotic. You, you're right to bring that up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and just, you know, like Moderna, you know, Moderna is a mere image of AstraZeneca. And AstraZeneca, along with GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, those are the two crown control pharmaceutical companies. So you can bet they're going to get most of the action on these vaccines as far as the contracts and, and, and the delivery. Um, but Moderna, that's mode RNA. It's spelled mode RNA, messenger RNA. That's what it is. And they, they just go to their own website. I mean, that's the thing. Just go to their own website and they'll tell you that it's got nanoparticles in it. And they'll tell you that it's a software upgrade for humanity. That's what they say on their own website. So this is serious business. And of course, the mass thing is just a pretext to try to get the obedience they need for the vaccination. And that's that's, uh, you know, that's Operation Warp Speed. That's a military operation. And that's what they're shooting for here. And so, yeah, there's going to be all kinds of, um, you know, nasty stuff in these vaccines. And you're just not going to get one. And then you're probably not going to be able to travel. And it's, you know, but I'm, I guess, you know, that's fine with me. I'm just perfectly content where I'm at. Um and I think people are just, you know, hopefully you've got, you're in a place where you're content to be for a while because uh, you're going to, if you go anywhere, if you do any of this stuff, you're going to have to submit to their thing unless we can just get enough people to say no. And that's what I'm still hoping. You're it still could happen in America. I think. You're still hoping. Where these days can people find you online? We, when we spoke last or, or the time before last, WordPress had shafted you and had taken you down for no good reason. Where can people find you now? Well, yeah, I just do the interviews once in a while, Richie, and folks can always find my books. Uh, just type in Dean Henderson, Amazon, and you get to all six of my books there. I don't have a website. I don't really want to have a website. Um, I'm content to do the interviews. I'm still, still trying, you know, I'm still uh, doing quite a few interviews and um, trying to just get the awareness out there. But uh, I've limited my computer time quite a lot in favor of hiking and uh and, and the outdoor world. And I'm perfectly content to do that at this point. So uh, that's that's about all I can say about that. Come back before Christmas, won't you? Stay in touch. Sounds great, Richie. Thanks, you, Dean. Uh, you take and take all, care of yourself, brother. You too, mate. And all the best to you and yours. Brilliant analysis uh, from Dean Henderson there, top man, live on the Richie Allen radio show at uh, five minutes, five and a half minutes to the top of the hour. The books that he referred to, all six of them can be purchased on Amazon and I can't recommend them highly enough. I mean, you're, you're talking, it's deep stuff, but he's a terrific writer. So he lays it out in a very, I suppose I use the word cogent way. And, uh, the most recent one, Nephilim Crown 5G Apocalypse is available, uh, paperback. You can get the Kindle version of it on, uh, Amazon for five quid, I think. And the paperback is, uh, is a tenner, I think, or something like that. But do check it out. Dean Henderson live on the Richie Allen radio show. Fiona Marie Flanagan in our one. So there you are now. That's about it, more or less, for this week. It's been an interesting week again. I, I do hope you have a good weekend and you take the advice of Dean Henderson. And if the weather permits it, do get out of your house and do spend some time outdoors. Spend some time in your local parks. You can't be too far away from a national park. Just get out. Get near trees and flowers and breathe in and uh, get away from your TV. He made a very good point earlier on, didn't he? If you turn the television off and you switch your laptop off, coronavirus doesn't really exist. 
really, when you think about it. Very salient point, I thought, there. So that's it then. I will be joined on Monday by Kevin Myers to talk about Kevin's latest read, which I've got again here in front of me, which is a really interesting... Oh, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. No, I've not got it in front of me, have I? No, no, I've not got it here. But anyway, uh, Kevin Myers will... will uh, Burning Heresies is the title of the new book. He'll be on with me on Monday. And you will remember me mentioning Peter Ebden on the programme the other evening. Peter sent me a book called Healing in a Hospital by a lady called Sandy Edwards. And I've um, reached out to Sandy and she's agreed to come on the programme. That's going to be a fascinating conversation about a study, a proper study, university controlled study of healing at NHS hospitals and what they found. Something everybody should know. Believe you me. So she'll be on the programme as well. And I'll be beavering away over the next couple of days to uh, fill next week's programme with interesting men and women as well. So then, until uh, mon- uh, until Sunday, because I will be with you on Sunday morning for Sunday View, 11 o'clock, again, if you're new to the Richie Allen Radio Show, Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock, we have a browse through the Sunday morning papers here, the UK Sunday papers, and we listen to some of the talk shows. What I do is I record some of the more interesting bits from the Sophie Ridge programme and the Andrew Marr programme. That's a Sunday view. A couple of tunes thrown in as well on Sundays at 11 o'clock. The regular radio show, Monday to Thursday at 5. Have a fantastic weekend. Look after yourselves and one another. Again, thanks to Fiona Marie Flanagan and Dean Henderson. Bye from me. Bye now.